I'm glad to see all of you here for uh, this uh, lunchtime event. As I was saying um, before we got started here, it, it doesn't matter how often I update the, 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 uh, the PowerPoints of the presentations, I open up my inbox and there's something new and different and I've got to update it again. And, and indeed, that's the case with what's going on right now with regard to Iran. Um, as uh, Adam has mentioned, of course, we all know now that the talks uh, will end in Vienna today uh, with no agreement reached and that there will be an extension. I also have heard that it might go as far as July uh, of next year. And um, we'll see from there. So. Um, I, what, what I would say is that um, I think we all agree that any kind of delay uh, plays into Iran's game. It's their interest, in their interest, uh, to extend these talks because as long as they do, uh, they uh, not only continue to reap benefits uh, as far as time to complete their nuclear weapons program, but also, of course, uh, to build up, back up their economy, which is getting uh, relief from sanctions in the meantime. Um, According to President Obama and also Secretary of State John Kerry, both have said uh, significant gaps remain, and I'll talk about some of those gaps uh, between the negotiating parties, which are, of course, the P5 plus one, Permanent Five, United Nations Security Council uh, members plus Germany, uh, Iran, and then, of course, the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, what we have seen over the past months since these negotiations have been underway uh, have been concession after concession by the United States, which uh, has unfortunately, I think, projected an image of desperation to reach an agreement. Uh, and in any case, uh, President Obama has made it very clear that whatever kind of an agreement might be reached with Iran um, will be done outside of and bypassing Congress. Now, as you probably know, Congress on both sides of the aisle, um, members have been very concerned uh, that they have some role to play in whatever this agreement is to be. Um, and uh, they do not like the, uh, the, the, the fact of being bypassed and marginalized um, by the White House. So as certainly as you see the new Congress and newly elected representatives taking their, and senators uh, taking their uh, positions in January, I think you're going to see a renewed push um, by all of them. And this is, again, both sides of the aisle. This is not Democrat. This is not Republican. They all are interested in having more of a role to, to play in these negotiations. Now, as we all remember, uh, the negotiations began uh, way back in March of 2013. And uh, they were done in secret. The, the beginning of the talks were in secret. Uh, they bypassed Iran, uh, Israel as well. And um, the Israelis were not told officially at all about the beginning of these talks, which were um, uh, done uh, in Oman, using, using uh, that Persian Gulf state as a location uh, to begin the talks in secret, uh, trying very hard not to let Prime Minister Netanyahu know. But of course, he did find out from the Saudis who, by the way, are, I think we all understand, equally concerned or almost as equally concerned as the Israelis about the outcome, not just of the talks, but of course of Iran's nuclear weapons program itself. Um, so the, the, pro the, the process since March of two 2013 has been round after round of talks in various places. Vienna has been the most recent, but there have also been meetings in Geneva uh, after Oman and then uh, in New York too. And the pattern has been one of the United States administration reaching out, reaching out, begging, pleading, groveling at the feet of the mullahs to please talk to us, please give us some talks, please give us an agreement. Uh, there have been secret letters, uh, which aren't secret anymore because somehow they got leaked, or the existence of them at least, got leaked to the media. Um, and then, of course, the most recent um, leak that, that came out is the administration um, seeking to uh, tie nuclear weapons program negotiations with Iran to some kind of an agreement with Iran on how to deal with the Islamic State uh, over in the, uh, the Iraq-Syria area. So let me get this straight. In return for um, the United States um, taking up uh, a, a position to, uh, to, to fight against the Islamic State in order to protect two Iranian puppet regimes, one in Baghdad, one in Damascus, the only territory so far actually threatened or taken over. In return for us doing that uh, for Iran, who's 
puppets they are, um, we should give Iran some concessions in the nuclear talks. Not quite getting how this is going to work out. Uh, the impression, as I said, given very strongly that the U.S. is desperate for a deal. Um, and uh, the Iranians taking every concession offered and, and then not even being satisfied but asking for more. Uh, the, 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 the process has been pretty clear. Uh, take whatever they can get re and, and, and deny uh, an agreement, um, but then ask for more concessions. And indeed, that is how these talks, most current ones in Vienna, have concluded and broken down. Here are some of the sticking points apparently in those negotiations. Uh, one of the big ones is about uranium enrichment. Of course, this is the primary pathway uh, to the nuclear bomb that Iran has chosen, and it involves uh, enrichment uh, in centrifuges at uh, Natanz, Fardau, and other places. Uh, questions exist about how many centrifuges Iran will be allowed to keep. They currently have about 19,000 of them. Uh, not all of them hooked up or running, but 19,000. And we have absolutely no idea how many others in secret locations might exist. Uh, but that's what's known or been reported to the IAEA and, and the West. Uh, and then, of course, the, the other question about the enrichment and the centrifuges is um, which generation of centrifuge will be allowed to be used by the Iranians. They are up to generation six by now, uh, installed only up to the second generation. They call these IR, meaning Iranium, uh, Iranian, slip there, uh, Iranian, and then dash uh, one, two, three, four, five, six for the generation of, of centrifuge. Well, uh, installed so far, I think only up to the second generation IR2, but they are working on designs, research and development for designs that go all the way up to a sixth generation. And as you might imagine, each generation is faster, better, more efficient at spinning up uranium than the last one. That's the idea. Um, and so the important part there is not just about numbers of centrifuges anymore, but which generation of centrifuge will they be allowed to use and how many, because um, the output is the thing, not just numbers of centrifuges, but if you've got faster, better ones, they're going to put out you know, more enriched uranium faster. So that question still separates uh, the, the negotiating teams. Um, Coming out of Iran most recently has been a new term, at least it was new to me, separative work unit, um, uh, SWU. And what that refers to is what I was just talking about, is how much enriched uranium is put out by the centrifuges. So again, not counting just pure numbers of centrifuges, but rather what generation and what their capability of output is in terms of enriched uranium per time period, week, month, year, whatever. Um, and according to what the Iranian side is now um, at least leaking or talking about that we have, we, we have heard in the media, uh, is that, the, and I'll get to this a little bit more, is that they want enough SWUs to make about 38 nuclear bombs a year, or sufficient to make about 38 bombs a year. That was the demand, uh, the last demand that I had heard. Uh, the other issues separating the sides, pace of sanctions relief, how fast they're going to get their money released to them, not if anymore, but how fast, and also then how fast um, other sanctions uh, will come off um, in terms of allowing, for instance, uh, Western companies and others uh, to do business with Iran. And I, I don't see that sanctions are going to ever be put back together in the kind of international uh, cooperative network that we had before these talks began. Uh, that, that train has left the station. I don't think they can ever be put back together again in that cooperate, uh, you know, as many and as, as, as severe sanctions as we had before. The other thing I'll say is that I really think um, from reading all the quarterly reports of the IAEA going back several years, that as the sanctions began to bite, the program, instead of slowing down or halting, sped up. What I'm saying is that I think the sanctions actually contributed to the acceleration of Iran's nuclear weapons program, not the opposite. One would think enough sanctions and they're going to slow down or cooperate or something, but no, it, if you look at the reports of what they've done in terms of how many centrifuges, how much uranium, how many additional um, 
uh, enrichment sites, and then also uh, the missile development, intercontinental ballistic missile development, all just really, uh, you know, pedal to the metal uh, since the sanctions began to bite, but we can probably debate on that. Um, and then, of course, the past activities. Uh, the IAEA in particular has been out front on this issue, which is that they demand, reasonably so, if we're going to go forward with an agreement um, you know, that we can trust the Iranians to keep, um, the demand that their past activities ought to be fully transparent and owned up to. Well, of course, the Iranians balk at that. They don't want to talk about what they've done, because what they've done is develop a nuclear bomb, and the delivery means in the missiles to deliver it. Uh, well, Iran has some red lines, too, and uh, they have made it known that they flat out uh, will not dismantle anything, any part of their nuclear program. Uh, those ICBMs are not even on the table for discussion. Um, and then I talked about those separative work units, the number being ascribed to the Iranian regime position is 190,000, as I said, spun up into weapons-grade uranium. That would equal... Uh, enough for 38 bombs a year. Uh, here is Yuki Amano, the Secretary General of the IAEA, and he um, sort of gave a, a hint ahead of time earlier this month in November that things were not going well in discussions, and uh, basically said, and, and quite honestly for a, an IAEA Secretary General, that the, uh, the Iranians were simply not complying with the obligation to explain what the IAEA calls possible military dimensions of their nuclear program. I want to talk about one element of that military dimension because it has to do with a site that's been very much in the news lately. It's Parchin, and it's a place where the IAEA thinks Iran formerly, uh, well, or maybe even up until currently, uh, was developing nuclear triggers and using the site uh, for the testing of those nuclear triggers, the things that actually set off uh, an atomic bomb. They, a, a bomb doesn't start by itself. It has to be triggered. And these things are the triggers that they were testing at Parchin to, uh, to do that. Now, you can see in the uh, overhead here uh, from online uh, the containment uh, facility that the IAEA thinks was being used to test those uh, triggers. Now, what happened after some of this became public, I mean, satellites are great, you know, and the internet is too, um, that uh, even as the IAEA was being denied access, satellite photography imagery like this showed that the Iranians were kind of cleaning up the site, apparently, because several buildings disappeared. Uh, and that was under Iranian uh, control, they disappeared. Uh, they did it. Um, and this was a couple of years ago already. And two or three buildings, as you can see, were just simply raised to the ground and the ground scraped. And what this, what this re re evokes for me is memories of a place called Lavizan Shian, which after its exposure by the Iranian opposition in 2002 or 2003, uh, was likewise raised to the ground and uh, dirt and plants and trees all taken up and carted off. And uh, that was so that Tehran could have a new municipal park. They needed some picnic benches. And so the regime said they really wanted to give this land to them. And, and that was the reason they raised it to the ground. But it, um, it, it, the memory comes back now that what they've done in Lavisa. Now, um, let's look again at Parchin. Uh, in at Parchin. Uh, just a month ago, we saw uh, something happen inside of Parchin that absolutely was an explosion not just uh, heavy earth movement um, or equipment moving moving buildings or earth, but an actual explosion here online again from in a satellite imagery of the before and after photos. Um, something very surgically took out a number of buildings on the Parchin facility site. Uh, the IAEA is still not allowed in. All right, the extension might go out six months to a year. Uh, as we know now, the uh, date of, well, at least the month of July is being discussed. What would happen is that the terms of the joint plan of action agreed to last November 2013 would be continued uh, in effect for that period of time. And what those terms in, uh, included um, was uh, that enrichment was permitted, but up to the 3.5% uh, level, we're under 5% level, let's say. Iran gets to keep all its centrifuges. It's allowed to continue R&D on the newer ones. Um, the stockpile existing of low enriched uranium they could keep, but it was supposed to be diluted down to a less usable form that would be harder or would take more time for them to reach 
uh, uh, weapons grade if they tried to uh, dash for it and, and spin that up to weapons grade levels. Um, so the stockpiles remain, uh, and then uh, the inspectors of the IAEA would be allowed to go to Fardel, Natanz, and Arak. We'll talk about Arak in a minute. It's their heavy water reactor site where they can pursue the second pathway to a bomb, which is plutonium pathway, and uh, they are still building and finishing that facility. It's not uh, done yet. But the inspectors cannot go to other places that we do know exist, like Hondab, under a mountain, and Parchin, which we just talked about. Just want to mention that this is how the Iranians look at this whole thing. I've mentioned this in earlier presentations to you, some of you. And uh, this was a top uh, advisor to the uh, Iranian regime appearing on Syrian TV uh, about a year ago, where he said uh, this Geneva Agreement, the Joint Plan of Action Intermediate Agreement, it's nothing but the Treaty of Hudabiyah. Now, you all know what the Treaty of Hudabiyah is, right? Uh, it, it's, it's simply uh, the example of Muhammad back in the year 628 who wanted to take the city of Mecca, but he didn't have the forces to do it, so he made a treaty very uh, conveniently and said uh, he signed a 10-year treaty with the Meccans and said, okay, uh, we signed this treaty. And then about uh, two years uh, later, 18 months later, he had enough forces and he marched into Mecca. And that is the example of what a treaty of Hudabiyah looks like. Well, that's what the Iranians are talking about. Um, our objectives are fundamentally incompatible. I think as long as the talks go on, we're never going to reach a commonality of objectives. And of course, the West, the IAEA, the P5 plus one, want to ensure that Iran is not able to break out, in other words, dash to a nuclear bomb in any time period less than one year. Well, Iran's objective is quite different. They want sanctions relief and the ability to, to make a deliverable uh, nuclear bomb. Uh, another objective for Iran that one of their spokesmen alluded to recently is uh, to, quote, absolutely avoid a climate of confrontation with escalation. I think we can understand what that's about. All right, these are some of the things that would be necessary if an agreement were to be reached that actually would be able to keep Iran from obtaining a nuclear bomb. Um, the cessation of all nuclear enrichment, according to at least six United Nations Security Council resolutions, complete stop to nuclear enrichment. The centrifuges, or at least many, many of them, would have to be dismantled. Uh, enrichment would have to stop at Fardau. The construction at Arak, the heavy water reactor plant, would have to stop. Uh, the inspectors of the IAEA would have to be granted access to all known and even suspected uh, nuclear sites in Iran. Uh, unannounced, SNAP inspections. Uh, Iran would have to come clean on its past program. Uh, sanctions relief ought to be linked very closely and directly to Iran's compliance with these measures. And then a long-term agreement should be reached. The West is seeking an agreement uh, in decades, um, including their ICBMs, but Iran wants a treaty of only 10 years or less. You know why? because the Treaty of Hudabiya was for 10 years, and the example of Muhammad is what they must follow. They cannot sign an agreement for longer than 10 years because Muhammad didn't. In our Congress, uh, and I mentioned, I, you know, I referred to that a little bit earlier, but as the new Congress takes uh, office in January, um, two representatives, uh, or senators, I really should say, but uh, Senator Robert Menendez, a Democrat from New Jersey, and Senator Mark Kirk, a Republican from Illinois jointly had attempted to impose or to pass new sanctions last year, legislation uh, that would kick in if Iran either broke any part of the agreement or uh, broke off the talks. Well, the, the legislation did not go through, but Senator uh, Kirk has said that he will reintroduce that legislation come January. Um, let's look at some of the unintended consequences really quickly bef uh, before I conclude here uh, of, of what would happen if a Middle East nuclear arms race breaks out, which in fact it may already be in the incipient stages of doing anyway. Uh, the Saudi king, the Saudis in particular are very concerned, as, I mean next to Israel, uh, about Iran getting a nuclear weapons capability. And as long ago as 2009, King Abdullah said, if the Iranians get nuclear weapons, we will get nu nuclear weapons. That's the Saudis. Now, um, former Saudi intelligence chief, uh, Prince uh, Turkaya Faisal, 
also has said something similar, whatever Tehran gets, Gulf Arabs will want. Well, it's not only will want, but actively already involved in. Here's the United Arab Emirates. Um, they have advanced plans for domestic nuclear power production. Uh, two nuclear facilities in the UAE are under construction due to start up 2017, one, 2018, the other. Uh, the uh, UAE has agreed to forego uranium enrichment and sign an agreement to that effect. But if Iran gets the bomb and everybody knows it, that uh, agreement might not hold. Um, uh, here we talk about the Saudis again. They are concerned enough that they actually paraded, they're, they're old, quite old, but a couple of their nuclear-capable missiles down Main Street uh, in Riyadh at a, at a military parade earlier this year. That was a message. Jordan, Kuwait, Qatar probably won't be further, uh, far behind, not to mention Turkey and Egypt. Egypt, by the way, has been enriching its own uranium for many years. It's got the capability. It knows how to do it. That's Egypt. Um, all right, uh, Iran and Russia have uh, signed a new nuclear uh, uh, power plant agreement uh, just a little while ago, a week or two ago. Uh, it is a long-term pact. The Russians are supposed to be able to construct up to eight nuclear power plants for the Iranians under this agreement. Uh, all right, what are the influences playing on our Congress and other uh, national security leadership and policy makers? Well, uh, let's talk about the Iran lobby very quickly, and I will finish. Um, here is Trita Parsi, who is the founder and president of uh, NIAC, N-I-A-C, stands for National Iranian American Council, one of the most consistent and persistent voices on Capitol Hill and in this town. Uh, to, to uh, urge the adoption of Tehran's agenda. What is that agenda? Stop the sanctions, lift the sanctions, unfreeze uh, the bank funds frozen in different banks, take military uh, response off the table, um, and uh, allow us to enrich as much as we want, among other things. Um, I wanted to point out this magazine here. This is The Economist of two weeks ago. And in here is a very uh, lengthy, it's the cover uh, article, um, which essentially says what the, what the title says. Uh, the, the revolution is over. Amanda took one look at this and she said, where's the question mark after that phrase, after that title? Well, as you can imagine, it's quite the puff piece. It's all about how the youth in Iran want nothing more than uh, high-tech toys like iPads and iPhones and uh, whatnot. And uh, they just want to be connected to the, to the broader world and wear blue jeans and, and so forth. And that uh, in any case, the revolution was a long time ago and nobody goes to mosque anymore anyway. So um, we should uh, deal with Iran as it is today. Um, little thing that they left out, of course, was that as much as the youth might want blue jeans and iPads, uh, the regime has its sights fixed on uh, some things a little more serious than that, uh, like a nuclear weapons program. Uh, I should mention uh, the, the, the contributors to that uh, report include uh, Trita Parsi, Nayak. Will they get the bomb? Are they rational? Question mark. I'll finish there. Thank you.